As a doctor, one of the important considerations that I need to think about in terms of COVID-19 is what are some of the interventions that we do which may increase the risk of transmission. And it's certainly recognised that aerosol generating procedures can increase the risk to healthcare workers who are exposed to patients who are infected with the virus. And this is because if you have a larger amount of flow through the airway, and if that flow is projected into the atmosphere around the patient, then it can increase the amount of droplet transmission that occurs. My name is Greg Fox and welcome to my masterclass on respiratory infectious disease transmission. Respiratory infectious diseases include a range of different pathogens uh, from viral illnesses to bacteria to fungi. Most of the common infectious diseases that we find in uh, the general community are viral infections such as uh, influenza virus uh, and various coronaviruses including the COVID-19 virus SARS-CoV-2. Uh, today I'll be talking about how these viruses transmit and how we can learn from the biology of COVID-19 and other respiratory infections to understand how we might prevent transmission. So viral illnesses can be transmitted when the viruses that are located in the respiratory tract become airborne. And that can occur as the uh, air, which is breathed in and then out, passes over the respiratory mucosa. That can lead the particles of the virus to be uh, taken up into droplets and then transmitted into the air. And really it's the size of the droplets that are most important in determining how transmission occurs. We think that for COVID-19, the transmission of the disease occurs largely in droplets which are more than five micrometers in size, and therefore they can't travel that far. For smaller droplets, uh, such as uh, uh, for transmission of diseases like tuberculosis, which is uh, caused by a bacterium called mycobacterium tuberculosis, we think that the droplets are even smaller, less than five micrometers. And if they're very small, that allows the droplets to remain airborne, potentially for hours and to transmit. The difficulty is working out uh, for each infection, how long the infection is likely to remain in the air and how far they're likely to transmit. And the way that we can do that is really through looking at people who are exposed to uh, infectious patients and working out how much contact that they had. If we look at tuberculosis, uh, which is a bacterial infection, uh, it's certainly been uh, seen that the uh, bacterium can transmit through the air over long distances. Um, there are examples in zoos, for example, where there's been one animal that's infected and that another animal quite some distance away has been infected after exposure. Uh, and similarly, in uh, more infectious uh, viruses, such as chickenpox or uh, the measles, uh, the distance over which these droplets can transmit may be larger. But for COVID-19, the evidence that we have so far seems to be that the size of the droplets is likely to be larger because the transmission seems to be over a shorter distance. And so if somebody coughs or sneezes, then the droplets that come from their respiratory tract can spread. And we think that maybe that's around one and a half to two meters in distance. But uh, there are some cases in SARS-CoV-1, which was the cause of the SARS epidemic in the early 2000s, where there seemed to be transmission uh, between places which weren't physically connected, suggesting that maybe coronaviruses can transmit in smaller droplets. But there's still a lot of research to be done on this topic. The key is, though, that transmission is likely to be related to the infectiousness of the host, the person who's sick, as well as the proximity and the duration of exposure to the person who's nearby. And what that means is if a person has prolonged exposure uh, and if the person is in closer contact, then they're more likely to become infected. The infection uh, will uh, likely be due to a combination of factors. Uh, that is, uh, whether they breathe in the air, but also whether they touch the surfaces that the virus has been located on. And for some viruses, this is more important than others. 
We know that uh, for patients in isolation uh, with COVID-19, that viral RNA can be detected on the surfaces uh, of the rooms in which they're located, and that that RNA uh, may be able to be picked up by somebody if they touch that surface and then transmitted to their mucosa. And so typically if somebody touches a, a door handle or a surface that has been touched by somebody who has produced secretions with the virus, then they touch their eyes or their nose, and then the virus can be um, uh, inf infectious for that person. Uh, but we really don't know exactly how long COVID-19 uh, infection is likely to be transmitted on a surface. There have been some studies that show that the virus could last for maybe five to 10 hours, uh, but it's really possible uh, that although the RNA is detected, it may not be infectious. And so we need to do more research to find out exactly how long a uh, surface can be contaminated for. The other interesting uh, possibility uh, with COVID-19 is transmission by other bodily fluids. And it's certainly been recognized that the virus can cause diarrhea and that the RNA can be found in the diarrhea. But up to now, there's not been convincing evidence that the virus is actually transmitted by uh, the diarrhea. But again, uh, because we're learning so much as we go, we need to do further research to investigate this further. One of the interesting questions around transmission of COVID-19 is the effect of age. Now, unlike for some viruses, such as influenza, where it seems like children uh, can be quite infectious, uh, some of the evidence we have so far suggests that COVID-19 uh, is less likely to transmit in children than in adults. There's been a few studies that have shown that in classroom environments, even when children or when their teachers have had the infection, that there's been very limited transmission. And this is pretty important because it gives us an idea about how high risk the classroom environment is for transmission. But again, because we're still learning, we don't know exactly whether there are some children who may be more infectious than others, and whether there is a different um, mechanism of the immune response to COVID-19 uh, in children. Another important question is how long are people infectious with COVID-19 infection and with other respiratory infections? And we generally, uh, in a population, uh, say that there will be a range of answers to that question. So uh, if in the case of COVID-19, we think that people uh, may remain infectious for up to 14 days, but there could be a big variation in that number, depending upon how sick the person becomes and how large a number of viruses the patient is producing. Uh, once a person becomes infected, we think that for COVID-19, uh, about a median of four days is the time between when they've been initially infected and when they develop symptoms around the time that they develop symptoms, they are the most infectious. And we think that before they develop symptoms may be a period when transmission can occur, even though they feel well themselves. And so different guidelines recommend 24 or 48 hours before the onset of symptoms is, is a time when infection could have occurred. And we're still learning about uh, precisely what are the conditions for minimally infectious people that transmission can occur. Once a person becomes infectious though, it is important that they remain isolated because they can be producing these airborne respiratory droplets and they can transmit certainly through coughing, sneezing and singing um, and uh, potentially, as I mentioned before, there's a chance that they also could be transmitted further distances. Um, there's some interesting studies which have been done that show that uh, people who sing seem to be very infectious. And there was a cohort in the United States with a very high rate of transmission to other people in a choir who'd been singing together for a couple of hours. And so it's therefore really important uh, that if people are suspected to be unwell due to a respiratory virus, that they minimize the amount of contact that they have with people during that time and that they take appropriate precautions to prevent transmission. As a doctor, one of the important considerations that I need to think about in terms of COVID-19 is what are some of the interventions that we do which may increase the risk of transmission? And it's certainly recognized that aerosol generating procedures can increase the risk to healthcare workers who are exposed to patients who are infected with the virus. And this is because if you have a larger amount of flow through the airway, um, and if that flow is projected into the atmosphere around the patient, then it can increase the amount of droplet transmission that occurs. And so for that reason, uh, intubation, which is the process of uh, 
sedating and then uh, putting a, a tube to assist patients to breathe, that process can be quite high risk for the anaesthetist or intensive care physicians that are performing the procedure. And so it's very important to use appropriate personal protective equipment during that process. Uh, in addition, uh, it's likely that transmission will occur uh, more frequently with non-invasive ventilation uh, and also potentially with high flow oxygen. And so under all of those circumstances, it's very important to only use when essential for patients who are suspected to have a respiratory infection and that uh, it, if it's done, that it be done with appropriate uh, infection control. And so in some hospitals, uh, patients need to be tested for uh, SARS-CoV-2 before they have initiation of some of these procedures in order to protect the staff and others who are in the hospital environment. One of the more interesting and difficult to prove questions is what effect does climate have upon transmission of respiratory infections? We do know that in warmer weather, uh, people are less likely to be indoors together. And so therefore they're less likely to be in close contact. And that means that the transmission of aerosols uh, and droplets is likely to uh, result in fewer infections because people are further apart and outside. At the same time, uh, if there is a high humidity, it may be that some of these droplets last longer in the air. And so the question of whether infections such as SARS-CoV-2 can be uh, less infectious in summer is an open question. Certainly there have been uh, cases of transmission in very cold climates right through to very warm climates. And so from a precautionary principle, I think it's unwise to assume that a warmer climate will necessarily protect people against the virus. We also know that the effect of ultraviolet light on the virus will uh, reduce its infectiousness. But of course, uh, that is only for particles that are actually exposed to the sun. And so people can still transmit uh, very easily indoors, even during warm weather. And the final point is that we know when people are in enclosed spaces, that they're more likely to have physical contact and contact with fomites or surfaces where the virus may occur, and also more likely to generate aerosols. And it's very difficult to distinguish between which mechanism led to transmission. And so for that reason, uh, even in warmer weather, even in summer, it's important that people continue to take precautions against transmitting the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So we've seen that the transmission of infection is dependent on a number of factors. It's dependent upon the host, the person who has the infection. It's dependent upon how close they are in contact with the person uh, who uh, is exposed to the infection. And it also depends upon the biology of the infection. And although we know quite a lot about influenza and tuberculosis transmission, we're still learning about SARS-CoV-2. And so therefore it's important to be cautious in avoiding exposure, um, even uh, though we think that most of the transmission occurs only within very close proximity.